Welcome to another episode of Femgineer TV brought to you by Pivotal Tracker. I'm your host, Purnima Vijay Shankar, the founder of Femgineer. In this show, I host innovators in tech, and together we debunk myths and misconceptions related to building tech products and companies. One common myth is how quickly a startup is supposed to grow. Many founders worry that if their startup isn't growing by the end of the first year, they've done something wrong and they end up shutting down their company altogether. However, it can take several years to really figure things out. And to help us debunk this myth around how quickly your company should grow, I've invited Ushma Garg, who is the CEO and founder of Gobble. Gobble is a weekly dinner kit delivery service that helps busy people cook their meals in 10 minutes or less with one pan. Thanks a lot for joining us today, Ushma. It's such an honor to have you on the show. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. I've been a fan for a while. Yeah. So you and I go way back. Yes. And our viewers out there, though, aren't familiar with your background. So why don't you start by just sharing a little bit about how you got interested in entrepreneurship? Sure. Um, I think I've just been a tinkerer all my life. And uh you know, from selling Girl Scout cookies to trading Beanie Babies to starting student clubs. Uh, I was just always interested in starting things and experimenting. But only when I came out to California did I kind of channel that and see the world of web startups and start interning and really getting my feet wet Mm -hmm. in what is traditional entrepreneurship. Yeah. And you had uh, a startup before you had Gobble. So walk us through what that was. Sure. Uh, I was at Stanford and I was starting this group called Stanford Women in Business. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were all looking for jobs and recruiters were looking for students, but it was hard to really get in touch. And not many people were using LinkedIn maybe, you know, six, eight years ago, uh, especially on college campuses. So I started a company to help students network with their first jobs and uh, big banks and consulting firms. Um, And I ran that out of my dorm room for the first two years. So uh, that was my company before Gobble. And actually, you know, helped inspire Gobble because I was running, you know, 100 miles a minute and not eating well and really had to uh, take a minute at a certain tipping point and care about my health. Uh, and, and, fig- and that starts with what you're putting into your body mm-hmm. and what you're eating every day. Nice. And so what did inspire you to start Gobble? Um, well, I think it, it starts with, you know, the tradition of of eating at home with your family Mm -hmm. and uh, really what love means in my family and especially what love means from my dad is cooking dinner for us. Mm -hmm. I have a sister um, and so me and my little sister and my mom um, really uh, experienced love from my father through all of his traditional North Indian food Mm -hmm. and contrast that to coming to school, starting companies, interning, and you're constantly eating, you know, Taco Bell and McDonald's. Uh, something was missing and I really didn't know what it was. And uh, and it became a very big personal issue for me. And I think that's because food not only brings you nutrition, but it brings you, uh, you know, nourishment and nourishment of the soul. So uh, what inspired me was set kind of when I was a child. Mm-hmm. And then upon becoming an adult and designing my own life, I needed to bring that element of family and love and connection and health back uh, and I think in the modern world, it's hard to do that. And yeah. there comes Gobble. Okay. So yeah, walk us through your sort of inspirational or moment of inspiration. Yeah. Um, well, really, I was sitting on California Avenue in Palo Alto in my car at 2 a.m. And I had just come back from Taco Bell. And so I was just eating these like bean burritos and looking out outside of my window in the darkness. And I saw uh, actually Aaron Levy from mm-hmm. Box sitting uh-huh. in his car and eating takeout. And so it was just this moment of like, how did I get here? Mm-hmm. And how is this all that I'm eating? Uh, and even though I was playing with ideas and working with great people, I wasn't happy. So that was the tipping point. And the next day I decided, you know what, I'm going to post an ad uh, and see if anyone would be willing to cook dinner for me and my friends for just $8 a plate. So really it wasn't, I think the aha moment is when you actually realize you have a problem mm-hmm. and you take one baby step to solve it. You don't necessarily decide you're going to start a company, sure. but you decide you're just going to try to solve a problem. Mm-hmm. And so what was that problem for you? What was the opportunity that you saw? Yeah. Um, well, I just saw all of these. I just saw myself and lots of different very busy professionals mm-hmm. uh, 
eating really unhealthily and like wanting this um, wanting this home cooked food. Mm -hmm. And what was really cool is once we posted that Craigslist ad, we got 70 responses overnight and we saw that there were lots of moms and dads or, uh, you know, in traditional, I guess, like Indian culture, we call them aunties and uncles yeah. and people who are willing to make, willing to share, um, you know, their home cooking with you. So mm -hmm. the supply and the demand was there. Uh, and, um, and that really, you know, like spurred a very quick solution to mm -hmm. this problem. Okay. So what did you do next after that, after you noticed that there was like interest on, on both sides of the market? Yeah. Um, so I think this is cool because Gobble started very non-traditionally. Mm -hmm. It just started with pen, paper, my cell phone, and my car. Mm -hmm. um, we set up interviews with these home chefs, and you know, I just scheduled a different one on a different day. And my friends would come over to my office, and uh, we would just be eating for free. So okay. that's exciting. So yeah. for two months, we're just getting um, you know chefs to come over, um, and actually twice. Um, it, you know, it sounds like fun and games, but twice we got food poisoning. Oh, no. Okay. So that was really bad. Yeah. Like, to just knock you and all your friends out, not good. So… It's like the trough of sorrow in yes. startup land. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So that was, that was, that was not as ideal. Um, and from the early days, one out of six chefs, mm -hmm. we felt, was, you know, very professional, on time, cooked great food, uh, safely and all of that. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we kind of just signed them up for catering for us, mm -hmm. I guess. Um, and so pretty soon we collected this group of chefs. I had a calendar of who was cooking on what day. The chef would cook and bring it to me. And then I was actually the first delivery driver. And I just like drive it around to different offices mm -hmm. in the Palo Alto area. Um, and and it just like started step by step by step like that. And I think we did something like 2,000 meals mm -hmm. in just the first month. Oh, wow. Which sounds like a lot. Yeah. But, I, you know, it, it comes out to something maybe like 40 or 50 a night, let's okay. say. Um, so, it, but it was just really encouraging. The proof of concept was uh, very quick, and it just showed that there was a big need for this um, solution beyond just myself. Mm -hmm. So it's great that you had this rudimentary prototype and that you were seeing some traction yes. from that. What was the next thing that you were thinking of? You you were still, this wasn't yet a startup for you, right? Right. still like, oh, okay, I'm playing around with this idea. Right. Um, I, I really fell in love with the concept. Mm -hmm. I just, I fell in love with the fact that there were chefs making money and making a proud living off of this uh, idea mm -hmm. and that people were eating really well. Mm -hmm. And so I... I, I knew really quickly that this is what I wanted to do. And um, I actually transitioned out of my previous startup over a period of three months mm -hmm. and simultaneously raised Gobble seed round. Okay. So only after two months of this proof of concept, mm -hmm. uh, started asking friends for introductions. Mm -hmm. And then we raised $1.2 in angel money to just, like, hit the ground running, make an actual website, and mm -hmm. turn this into a company. Yeah. Now, I remember you had a pretty interesting story around raising that seed money. Yeah. You weren't getting a whole lot of yeses in the beginning. Yeah, yeah. So walk us through what that process was like. Absolutely. Um, you know, it's, uh, I had made kind of a target list of angel investors. Mm -hmm. And it's funny, looking back, I think I'm surprised at how bold I was. Um, but, I, but I think in the very beginning, you don't know what you're getting into, so you're even more brazen. And okay. I think that's a great thing. Okay. So I just, Airbnb was just starting at the time, and we were building this home-cooked meal marketplace, and I thought it was really on to something. And so um, one of the investors I targeted was Keith Raboy, who's mm -hmm. now a partner at Coastal Ventures. And, um, and he said no many times. And even though he said no, I kept getting intros from other friends, and I kept insisting um, that we meet. And I think it's because he um, he really had an expertise in consumer mm -hmm. and in food and in marketplaces. And there were um, a couple other investors we were pursuing at the time as well. But the cool thing is that after three or four touches, he finally agreed to meet. And within 30 minutes, we had our first check. Mm -hmm. So um, it, I think just like anything in life, you know, that early practice of just yeah. being very persistent um, – and, and also doing your homework, not right. just persistent for no reason, um, is is what gets you through. And that's what's going to get that same persistence and doing your homework um, and coming with something valuable to someone that's mutually successful is what's going to keep, you know, keep the startup growing at every step of the way. Yeah, that's great that you need to stay persistent. And as a solo founder, it's actually a struggle, right? You don't have that buddy, that partner to help you out. So why did you decide to go the path of being a solo founder? I know it's not that common here in the Valley. Right. 
uh, it's funny. I don't think I decided that way from the outset. Mm -hmm. And I tried to meet other folks who may want to, you know, start the company with me mm -hmm. um, through my network. And, um, and I think I got pretty far with a couple people, mm -hmm. but either they weren't willing to quit their day job or um, it, was, it just wasn't the right timing for them or they weren't so passionate about the idea. Um, and, and we even did, you know, work sessions together for a few weeks or weekends. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, I, I think I was just so excited by the idea and the proof of concept that I just wanted to hit the ground running. Mm -hmm. And I felt that this was, that that something was in the air in this space. Mm -hmm. And in true to form, so many food companies yeah. have just, you know, started up in the last few years. It's mm -hmm. it's crazy. So there, um, so I think that it, it, was a, is a, it was a combination of, um, not necessarily finding, you know, the right, like, founder soulmate yeah. uh, quickly. And then also um, just feeling that uh, drive that, you know, nothing should stop something that you feel so strongly about and passionate about. Um, so I think we would, I definitely would have added someone if I could have. And it, it's actually really hard. And there are some big lonely nights <laughs> and tough moments. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if, you know, the company took longer or shorter as a sole founder, um, but, uh, you know, but we just, that's just how it happened and we did it anyway. And mm -hmm. I think that whether you get funding or not, whether you have a founder or not, you know, whether you're a coder or not, um, the, the best companies don't let that stop them. Right. They just find a way and, and keep on chugging. Yeah. And so what was your first year like? Because it must have been a little bit of a struggle between fundraising and trying to get all of these meals out the door. Right. and building the site without having the technical co-founder to help you. Right. What was that first year like? Yeah, looking back, um, it was, uh, it, you know, um, we just learned a lot of hard lessons mm -hmm. um, by trial and error. And I think that's the best way to learn. So uh, we raised the seed round and we were really, really excited by that. Um, I had two engineers that were working with me um, and Moonlighting. Uh, one of them is actually one of the lead engineers at Uber now, which is exciting. Oh, cool. And 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 they were moonlighting to learn Ruby on Rails mm -hmm. at the time. They they um, had day jobs where they were coding in a different language. Uh, one of them ended up joining full time, and after a, a couple months, um, quit. So he was our lead engineer and couldn't handle the pressure of the um, of the startup and uh, think the future was uncertain. Um, and hadn't been in this role before or in a startup before. And, and so I think um, it just wasn't the right fit. And, and I found out very suddenly. Mm -hmm. And it was only a few weeks away from launch. So um, the year was full of those kinds of unexpected curveballs. Uh, and then we had to, you know, still be amicable, um, find some consultants to, you know, work together to transition the code. So um, I think the first year is about having a plan but adapting a lot to just still make, you know, make things happen when everything doesn't go according to plan. Or nothing goes according to plan. Or nothing goes according <laughs> to plan. Yeah. So that was a, a tough first year. So definitely not a time to think you should be shutting down where right. a lot of founders might be like, well, we didn't really grow. And on top of that, all these signs, these signs yeah. are, I can't get a technical co-founder. It's really hard to raise. People that I hired are leaving. Right. Just kind of Plow through, regardless. plowing through. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's kind of like a, it's kind of like when they say you know the phoenix emerges from the ashes. I feel like all these founders have um, moments where they're like in the crucible mm -hmm. and they're uh, they're just kind of like getting knocked around or in the ring really. And uh, um, and then at some point you you just like look up and 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 you made it yeah. somewhere. That was your first year. So walk us through what the second year was like. Was this a year where you were focused on customer acquisition? Yeah. Um, so actually, the next couple years are all in the same theme, which okay. is really around um, the journey to product market fit. Okay. So we iterated and made different versions of Gobble for quite some time. We started out as a marketplace uh -huh. where lots of chefs were posting menus and lots of families were ordering. Um, we had a short stint as an on-demand meal company, and I think we were the first on-demand meal company, but it would take... 30 minutes to get from, you know, one area in the peninsula to the other. Mm -hmm. And we learned that um, on demand is really hard to do. It's, yeah. it, maybe in some of these dense cities it's going to work out. But for our purpose of serving busy families, mm -hmm. it wasn't the right model. Um, and then we then we started a subscription service. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to focus more on the engineering and 
understanding your tastes, what you want to eat, and deliver you the perfect meal for you mm -hmm. every day. So really, and I think that is the first few years of any startup. Mm -hmm. A lot of startups, you know, move up their launch date, and then they say, oh, it was really founded three years afterwards, but sure. they were moonlighting or experimenting or at a different company working through the kinks. Everyone really spends, I find, that 10,000 hours or approximately three years of becoming an expert in some field. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and typically, even you know, Ben Silverman of Pinterest says it takes just about that time mm -hmm. to find product market fit. And, um, and for us, I think it was about three, three and a half years um, of totally different models, launches and shutdowns, all with the same mission of helping busy people have home-cooked food, mm -hmm. but totally different manifested companies. Yeah, I like what you said about the fact that people will say, oh, yeah, we just launched this, even though they've launched like three times before. Yes. And I think that's where a lot of the myth comes from of why people don't launch and then grow quickly within a year. Right. Because they say, oh, well, now we've technically launched and they've maybe got two or three years behind them. Right. And so it seems like they launched and then a year later they were on this like hockey stick growth. Right. So I think that's really valuable to, to note. So what did you do to actually acquire your customers then yeah. when you were doing all these different models? Right. So, um, you know, with, with all the models that uh, I guess that didn't work as well as the current one, we were fighting tooth and nail every day for customers. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think most um, most companies are like half product team and really half marketing team. Like right. the head of data, the head of engineering, everybody is involved in marketing and growth in some way, shape, or form, whether they're building the referral system or optimizing the conversion flow um, or directly, you know, running paid advertising, let's say. Um, but with the first few models, marketplace models, subscription, et cetera, I mean, I was like pounding the pavement and I was putting up gobble signs in laundromats, in coffee shops, um, like emailing, you know, like hospital mailing lists, just anything I could get my hands on. Mm -hmm. um, very, you know, not scalable uh, initial strategies to get a core user base up mm -hmm. and running. Um, and I think what is, what the truth is, is that getting a company to take off takes a really long time. And that is against um, sort of the myth that you see <laughs> in the press. Yeah. But the, the product that takes off really does um, go from zero to hero. If you can last all that way and if you have the perseverance. Um, Hopefully, you'll see one day where a product just is so good and so full of all of your insights and value to the customer that it really does take off in some kind of hockey stick fashion. Mm -hmm. um, and we never knew if we would get there. Mm -hmm. um, but our current 10-minute one-pan dinner kit um, really just hit the nail on the head. And, uh, and, and, and it embodies the feeling for uh, our busy families and parents that they want something fresh that they can control and that, you know, comes from these whole ingredients that they see, but they want it to be convenient, fast, not a sink full of dishes and mm -hmm. prepped for you. Mm -hmm. So that was the result of lots of experiments and insights and learnings. But when we launched that, the, you know, I, w I didn't have to fight tooth and nail. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to market all the time. People were posting on social media. They loved the product. They were coming back. Um, referrals, retention, word of mouth, they all move in the right direction. So I had always heard, you know, Mark Andreessen talk about this product market fit moment. Um, and there were times when I thought I would have it, but I was kidding myself. Yeah. And, um, you know, after a very long time and many years, finally, we did get to see it. And so I'm really grateful for that. And I think that um, that is when you see that really great growth, but it's not necessarily when the company starts. Mm -hmm. And what were some of the insights along the way? Like, were there a couple aha moments that you had that led you to then get to that kit? Yeah, great question. I think um, I think that there are a couple. Um, one is that we, like, one practice is to constantly spend time with your customers. Mm -hmm. And so we wouldn't have known the insights towards developing this dinner kit if we hadn't gone to people's houses mm -hmm. and watched them cook, watch their faces, watch their reactions to takeout or cooking or what have you. Um, and when one key observation was that we saw that people, um, when they microwaved food, they didn't smile. They weren't happy or like when it was in a plastic tray or whatever. So um, I learned that to really have a breakout company, it's not just good enough for someone to buy the product and consume it. They really have to feel super excited about it. They have to feel wow about it, mm -hmm. um, which is hard. 
And so uh, this was just getting the job done. And it's kind of like me eating that Taco Bell in my car at 2 a.m. <laughs> yeah. It was getting the job done. Um, but the, but the microwave experience and them not seeing the chef or how it was made and not filling the house with that sort of nourishing aroma and practice of cooking um, wasn't there. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we tried to, um, to insert. And the other piece that really made that happen was when we went to people's houses, we would take kind of our head of engineering, our head of data, our executive chef, and myself. And I think that um, any great innovation will occur at the edge of two industries mm -hmm. or more or multiple skill sets. So if you're an expert in one area, it real magic and innovation happens when like a whole other expert comes in and you guys do a lot of things together and you meld those perspectives and discover things that no one thought of. Mm -hmm. um, so it was really our executive chef coming in and saying, hey, in a restaurant, you know, we have mise en place, which is everything in place. Mm -hmm. And all the prep cooks come and they prep everything. And then the executive chef can walk in and whip up anything in 10 minutes. Um, but, you know, let's take a braised beef short rib with sweet pea risotto. That um, short rib has been marinating for days. Yeah. They're braising. Um, but all, that's all called the prep work. So we do all of that, just like they do in restaurants, um, for families and homes. So, it's, so it was learning about those different practices in, you know, personalization via, like, Spotify or Netflix, and then mise en place and prep work via the restaurants, mm -hmm. um, and just, you know, um, like, subscription commerce and the business model of shipping and how that makes unit economic sense. So it was putting all of those different things together from the different execs. Uh, that made the right model mm -hmm. and That's innovation. Great. Yeah. So there's a lot going on here. And, you know, you've got an executive team, you're meeting with customers. Did that $1 million really get you to discovering all these insights? Or did you have to go out and raise additional right. capital? Yeah. We had to be so scrappy. And it's really hard because you see all these flashy companies in the news <laughs> and they have like coffee bars and big company retreats and things. And um, we kept our burn very low in the very low tens of thousands a month um, until we finally found product market fit. And another, you know, myth to crack is that companies don't just have like seed series A, series B, series C. They all have intermittent rounds. Mm -hmm. And those rounds are just terms to help investors and people understand kind of the stage where a company is. Mm -hmm. But almost everybody I talk to behind closed doors will share that they had, you know, money coming in at all different moments. Yeah. So we had a couple follow-on rounds and bridge rounds, you can call them. That just means in between, mm -hmm. um, you know, af after our seed fundraising to keep us going. Mm -hmm. But they were still very small, just, you know, individual or, or two people follow-up checks. Mm -hmm. um, there was a time when, like, we were really close to dying. Mm -hmm. And we only had, I think, something like $8,000 in the bank. Mm -hmm. And it was less than a full payroll. Uh, and it was November and December, and those are holiday seasons, so our graph wasn't going to go up, and I couldn't raise money from anyone, and I couldn't get any more follow-on money from existing investors. So um, we, you know, we actually are very unconventional, and we joined Y Combinator, mm -hmm. um, you know, three years into the company uh, after a seed round and after, you know, hiring people. And um, I remember you weren't too keen on going to – to YC. Yeah, I wasn't. And and because it's like, it's not traditional and it's kind of a blow to your ego. You know, it's like, I'm not just starting the company. I'm not, uh, you know, I was, typically people use demo, demo yeah. day to raise their first round. And it's, you know, the, the organization of YC is really expanded and mm -hmm. they're helping all kinds of companies at all kinds of stages now. Okay. Um, so that's really awesome and exciting. But, you know, at the time, um, it was still something where I had to kind of, you know, swallow my pride mm -hmm. and say, look, you know, am I just going to let the company die because of ego here? So, um, that's a good, it's a good lesson to learn. It's a great yeah. lesson to learn. Um, and, 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 and I think, you know, great companies are filled full of those moments mm -hmm. where you have to just do whatever it takes. It doesn't matter how you look. Um, it, it matters if you believe in what you're doing, if you think it's valuable and, and you're just going to do whatever it takes. So we did, and um, and thank goodness, because it gave us that extra, you know, burst of energy, the network, the and then the capital, frankly, mm -hmm. to just keep going another day, mm -hmm. and um and and that fueled uh, another round at Demo Day, mm -hmm. which fueled the um 
be able to hire our executive chef mm-hmm. and then meet the customers and then develop the dinner kits, which then fueled our Series A. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's those kinds of, you know, moments that really define if um, if you're in it for the long haul and yeah. if you're if if you're going to make it work or not. That's great. So that's, so that's great that you were starting to see these signs and that YC helped a lot. But I imagine there was a lot of competition by the time you decided to go raise your Series A, right? Like there right. were a lot of companies in the food space. Right. So walk us through how you were starting to kind of do hand-to-hand combat with that. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. And that's those are the exact right words. Okay. I kind of… I love this book called Blue Ocean Strategy, Uh and I see these crowded spaces as this, like, bloody red ocean where we're all just, like, swimming and paddling really hard and just fighting each other, Um, and and there's, like, not a lot of room, and you have to just kind of, like, swim out to fresh water if you can and Mm -hmm. and break out as a company. So um, there were tons of food companies, and um, some are still around. Some have pulled back. Many have died, mm-hmm. uh, but there were ones who, um, you know, like Good Eggs that make a food marketplace, or there's companies that do on-demand food delivery. There's many that do subscription boxes like we do now. Um, and I think what uh, we are differentiated in that we um, were the only ones that help you, like, make a fresh meal quickly mm-hmm. um, and meet those specific needs of, like, a modern, busy professional uh, and in the back end, we have these, like, really large-scale kitchens with hundreds of people, like, peeling carrots, chopping onions, marinating meats, making sauces that then go into our boxes. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas all other subscription food companies put a tomato, a lemon, you know, an onion in a box. Mm-hmm. And it's um, very much delivering the right groceries for any given recipe, but not helping you with the cooking. Yeah. Um, so I think we're differentiated not because… I looked at the competition and wanted to differentiate. Mm -hmm. But because I saw this problem and I saw nothing else solving the problem and I came up with this bespoke solution to solve it. So it's really hard to put the blinders on and not think about what the competition is doing. Um, But but I think that that's the way that you come up with real innovation and that you become hopefully the creative leader in your space. I think that persistence is necessary, but in a competitive space, preserving that creative DNA – is like uh, absolutely critical to differentiation and and breaking out. Um, people will come after you, and I think that now that we're in the scaling stage, mm-hmm. the worry is about copycats doing executing and doing what you created better mm-hmm. than you. Um, so you know, bringing in house all the expertise to continue executing with excellence, not just creating and coming up with ideas, is kind of um, where we're working now. So now as you start to scale and people become more aware, obviously you're going to have competition, but the other piece that you're going to have, and probably even early on, is that criticism. Absolutely. Right? You're not doing this right or that right. You're not servicing this model versus that. Sure. And it could come from anywhere, right? It could come from like behind this couch right now. So how how have you dealt with that? Or was there like a recent experience that you've had to deal with it? Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, it's, I mean, it's it's no fun yeah. at all. Um, and we've certainly had our moments where the press has said, you know, like, is Gobble still alive? Um, and uh, and just sort of joked about uh, our journey mm-hmm. and the time it's taken to grow. And especially because um, we didn't change the name. Sometimes mm-hmm. companies change yeah. the name and have different ideas. Uh, but we've just stuck it through when I liked the name and I liked the mission and we kept it moving. Um, I think – an early lesson that I learned was to compete with myself and not with others. Mm-hmm. And so I um, like I think I'm my own harshest critic anyway. It's not nice when it comes from the outside, but um, all founders and CEOs and I think people need to continue the practice of, you know, not basking in all the compliments mm-hmm. and also not just kind of like, you know, curling up in a ball at all the criticism and really um, – developing uh, the ability to listen very closely to your inner voice Mm -hmm. and your compass and say, hey, did I do something wrong or did I do my best here? And and that is what should really determine how you feel about yourself and Mm -hmm. your emotions. So as you were getting this criticism, you were probably also getting a lot of rejection, especially with fundraising. Yeah. Right? So so glorious, all this startup (laughs) stuff. It's so exciting, you know. (laughs) <laughs> rejection everywhere. Yeah. So how did you deal? I think you went back to some investors that rejected you, right? For the right. Series a. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, 
And it's so important to know that, uh, you know, if you really love your idea, you're going to talk to the same people over and over. And Silicon Valley is very small and, um, and, and it might not be the right time for someone to invest. And you're going to be really upset about it because you need the money and you feel like they should invest. Um, but I've found that we've pitched the same investors like three, four, five times and mm-hmm. seed different Series A attempts and then maybe even for future um, fundraising attempts. So it's um, – it's so important to be gracious and courteous when someone says no. Mm-hmm. Uh, and because you just never know, that might be the, the person who really saves you or wants to work with you down the line. Mm-hmm. So it's totally okay to go back even after they've rejected you. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I think, um, you know what? I think that ego often gets in the way of success. Mm-hmm. And so uh, like being able to deal with rejection and just not take it personally yeah. and you know, stay in touch with people that uh, that say it might not be the right time right now. That's um, that's important, and like I said, it just maintains your options for the future. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you so much, Ushma. This has been a lot of fun. I've learned a lot. I know our viewers have as well. Any final words of wisdom for our audience out there? Yeah, I think um, I think it's just important to take that first step. Mm-hmm. That's, you know, people get very daunted and they think starting a company is this big deal. But we need more entrepreneurs. We need more creativity. And uh, I think. If, if you can just pare it down to what would the first step be mm-hmm. to explore this idea, then um, that would be my advice to folks. And uh, and meanwhile, I'd want them to eat well. Yes. So uh, we made this code FEMGENEER17, um, FEMGENEER17. And everyone who is, you know, in your uh, followers can get a free box of Gobble, which is a whole week of and three free dinners. And that's our best deal. Great. Well, we'll be sure to share the code with all of you so Great. you can – Make sure you get well-fed this week. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you. And thanks to all you viewers out there for tuning in today. And special thanks to our sponsor, Pivotal Tracker, for their help in producing this episode of Femgineer TV. If you've enjoyed this episode, then please be sure to share it with your friends, your teammates, and your boss. And be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel to receive the next episode of Femgineer TV. Ciao for now. This episode of Femgineer TV is brought to you by Pivotal Tracker. Build better software, faster.